okay? So now I want to turn my attention to, uh, with the now, not time I have left, <laughs> to the value of Jewish nationality. And I'm limiting my discussion to the Israeli state rather than the West Bank or the, or the Gaza Strip, which isn't occupied until 20 years after the establishment of Israel. And while Jewish nationals experience, can I get the slide now? And not have this count for my time? Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. I, I'll keep talking. Okay. Yes, so, while well, Jewish nationals experience similar privilege uh, throughout Israel and the occupied territories, Israel's treatment of Palestinians differs based on their territorial jurisdiction. The West Bank, East Jerusalem, Israel, and the Gaza Strip. Mind you, this is a very misleading uh, map because Israel never declared its borders and in fact what you see here is actually not true how do I so this would be the West Bank all the gray areas are in fact where Israel's non borders extend and as a result of war here we see the non border extend 44 percent into the Gaza Strip over the course of uh, 52 days this summer so this slide that I show you is historic and something that's actually uh, subject to great contest. But the point is, is that Israel's policies towards all Palestinians, irrespective of jurisdiction, turns on the twin axioms of acquiring the maximum amount of land for the, with the least amount of Palestinians on it, and placing the maximum number of Palestinians onto a minimum amount of land. And Israel achieves this by martial law in the West Bank, by a mix of administrative and martial law in East Jerusalem, by warfare in Gaza, and through civil law in Israel. And for the sake of this discussion, I'm focusing on civil law because it'll be the most resonant uh, with the liberal democratic uh, framework that we began with. So there are three fundamental laws that consecrate uh, or ascribe value onto Jewish nationality. These are the Citizenship Law of 1952, the Law of Return of 1950, and the uh, Absentees Property Law of 1950. Without going into great detail about each one of them, suffice it to say that the Citizenship Law created a two-tiered system of Jewish nationals who were entitled to a certain set of rights distinct from Israeli citizens so that this bifurcation creates the Jewish Israeli and the citizen only and there is no such thing as Israeli nationality significantly this turns on its head the, uh, the, the value that we ascribe to citizenship in the US versus nationality but also reflects the plenary power when this was uh, brought before the Israeli High Court just last summer uh, the court decided that whether or not there should be Israeli nationality is not a decision for the court but rather for more political bodies okay so that's the citizenship law, and it creates this bifurcation. Significantly, it denationalizes Palestinians who are given nationality in 1925 under the British mandate. Now there's the law of return. The law of return, in sum, defines by, again, scientific measurement, who is a Jewish person, and also gives that Jewish person the right to immigrate into Israel, to claim citizenship, and to have a panoply of rights that are otherwise unavailable both to the indigenous population, its ref Palestinian refugee population, and creates a reciprocal relationship between the state and non-citizen Jewish nationals anywhere they may be in the world that diminishes the rights of those Palestinian citizens who are now 20% of the state within it. And this is a lot, so I'll just summarize. This is the absentees property law in 1950, which how Israel comes to acquire the majority of Palestinian lands without compensation by legislating a law that says property that is abandoned or by that it that is found abandoned or whose owners happen to be in enemy territory or whose owners happen to be in other parts of Palestine who are fighting against us will belong to the state and held in perpetuity by a custodian notably that holding is not without distinction not all the state citizens benefit equally from that holding because the state actually um, uses it for the exclusive benefit of Jews in order to benefit uh, through the use of parastatal organizations. All that I'm telling you <laughs> uh. 
can be summed up in this very simple chart. Um, which actually, so this is the distinction that how the bifurcation of nationality and citizenship actually functions to increase the property value of Jewish nationality, simultaneously uh, distinguish and discriminate against the various categories of Palestinians. Um, and it's significant that it seems convoluted because, in fact, liberal democracies use law rather than just the power of the state and violence in order to execute uh, in order to execute these I guess set settler colonial frameworks and exclusionary frameworks as a way to draw and increase their legitimacy so with that um, if you want to ask me about current uh, contemporary examples I'm happy to answer that but just to end with the the discussion of academic boycott as it's especially relevant today title six challenges here on the UC on UCLA's campus and otherwise that this is uh, becomes increasingly important and reflects the debate around affirmative action as well because of this idea and these locking notions of individuality and culpability for the individual as opposed to the group and reflects a certain entitlement that is actually not justifiable thank you Thanks to all the panelists. We unfortunately have about 10 minutes left for um, questions. We started a little bit late, but we need to stop at 11.20 because there's a midterm starting next door and we need to proceed to the next, uh, the next rooms uh, quietly. And Jasleen is going to come up and make some announcements about that. But I just want to, I think what I'll do is take, let's take three short questions or comments and then let the panel respond. So, so short questions or comments. Um, if not, I, I have, yes, Jerry, so, Jerry Kong. Uh, I, I think this is probably a question most between Noah and Russell. So both of you uh, emphasize the importance of baseline to know what the Jewish specifically about how to think about baselines and intra and intra group conversations about women discrimination. Russell's, you know, your description about best practices and how to invoke history is trading on what might be an appropriate baseline with which we would make historical sort of comparisons. Um, both of your suggestions, arguments, suggest that there's a way to persuade people this is the right way to think about a baseline. I want to know whether you thought invoking property as metaphor, methodology, or mechanism, whether the property frame especially helps you in persuading a group of people that you've got the right baseline. <laughs> so, Jerry, I'm disappointed because I expected a three-point, three-part question from I, you. I, I told him for to old times' sake, you know, and, and all you <laughs> offer is one very hard question. Um, I, I'll, I mean, I don't know. Um, I think that so. I'm actually going to remix this talk for a critical race conference in uh, Brisbane, Australia, uh, where the panel is policing race and sexuality. And I'm going to try to talk about policing identity. So I think that there are sort of different metaphors one could use to make the point. I do think that some of the power of Professor Harris's article is that in speaking the language of property, there are so many, you know, white, non-critical race studies, for students and professors that would never set foot in these spaces. And so to hear an article that's talking about property, that's part of the first year curriculum, like there's something really powerful about that intervention because you, it sort of you know, integrates this core category in the law and race and, and sort of can, I think, persuade people that otherwise wouldn't read an article about race. So that's sort of my thought. So yeah, um, I guess, I guess my instinct is to say that there is something particularly powerful about using property concepts in thinking about baselines because of the way that we have ideas around chains of title and thinking of uh, thinking around pop property in terms of transactions that can be imagined to be kind of uh, unwound um, in a way that I think might be particularly tied right to the way we think about property as opposed to other forms of social relations. So, so that makes me. Th I mean, that's a really off the cuff, but um, the, but I but I think that once when you're talking in in property terms, it becomes sort of more legible to talk about. Uh, both incremental moves away from some baseline and to ask the question um, about the, the legitimacy you know, of original title, other than uh, obviously you get right into the Johnson versus McIntosh questions about when, those, when that gets overridden and deployed in particular racialized ways. Other questions? Yeah, Addie. So one of the things that I think is, that I like about the article so much is that in reframing the, the concept 
kind of voidness and moving the discussion sort of to interrogating neutrality, it also makes possible, I think, a conversation about uh, group rights under equal protection law that usually isn't understood, right? So you can focus on, it's no longer a conversation about individual discrimination and, and interpersonal sort of competition. Um, and that is what makes, I think, reparations claims seem more plausible under that framework. And I was struck by how the other four of you, to me, seem to talk more about individual level rights. And so in particular, Nora, I, I kept thinking to myself, what happens to Palestinian group rights when, if, if you were to get full integration of Palestinians into an Israeli state that wasn't a Jewish state, what of what group rights? Uh, Rose, what about uh, territorial people's group rights if you, have, if you achieve the goal of full citizenship? Um, and Noah, I think this is actually relevant to yours, but I won't say more about it. I'll you respond if you want. Um, in thinking about the employer um, and whether the employer has done anything wrong as opposed to the competition between the workers. Okay, so I'll go after. Okay. Um, so, I mean, thank you for that question, Addie. I do, I do think that this, uh, the tension between group rights versus individual rights, um, that tension is definitely present in the issues with respect to the, the um, American Samoa and other issues related to the U.S. territories. Um, in, in American Samoa, for example, the national status question, or uh, specifically the birthright citizenship claim of the individual, Lenny Tua Awam, is contested by the group, by American Samoan chiefs and a number of other American Samoans who prefer national status yeah. over U.S. citizenship because of their view that acquiring U.S. citizenship could lead to the loss of their blood quantum land law, yeah. right? So there is, within American Samoa itself, a fight over whether citizenship should be applicable. And it's, not one, it's one that uh, maybe the courts should not participate in, that perhaps is part of the political process, but again, it brings into mind what power does the individual has in that particular domain in asserting a constitutional right that resides within the U.S. Constitution in which American Samoans have been excluded in many ways. Hi, Addie. <laughs> um, so part of the problem was time and being able to have these discussion because in fact when we're discussing boycott as a, a, a call to solidarity it's not calling for individual uh, remedies but in fact is based on group identities and part I focus specifically on the Palestinian citizens of Israel who deal with this type of exclusion but by at least pointing out that it, they are indistinct from those in the West Bank in the Gaza Strip so that they are in fact subject to uh, to a similar project of removal, containment, and and uh, diminishment. So, but this does raise the interesting question because of the lack of clarity. Again, I think it's a political uh, it's a political question. The lack of clarity about outcome. There, we can insist on equality, but equality makes actually uh, obfuscates the fact that this is a history of settler colonialism. Historically, settler colonial situations are remedied by removal of the settler. In this situation that's not being asked for. I mean, some sections of Palestinian society are asking for it, but others are not. The leading Palestinian leadership is asking for a limited self-determination onto uh, truncated pieces of land, and yet this movement is calling into question, the movement of um, a one-state solution, calls into question whether remedies that look more like the 14th Amendment jurisprudence that actually distributes goods and rights debate within the movement because most Palestinians don't want that latter course. This isn't something that can be remedied by individuals but will in fact require a group solution that isn't articulated by a, um, a legitimate uh, leadership. And so it's subject to question but one which I think is, 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 is that we engage with, and, uh, engage with and don't neglect. So I, I, I apologize. I'm told that we do not have time uh, to continue. So Jasleen is going to make an announcement about the next um, sessions, and then I hope you can come up individually and talk with people. And please join me in thanking our panelists.
So um, I do have a favor of everyone. Um, we have a midterm actually going on next door until 1150. Um, so I ask that you please, please keep conversations to minimum in the hallway for right now. Um, as there is more food um, and there's more coffee um, where you saw the breakfast area. Um, but please, if we can ask you, um, do so quietly. And once you get to your classrooms, then you can resume your conversations. Um, and the students will thank you very much. And um, if you don't know where the classroom is that you are going to next, find a student. Students, raise your hands. So find one of these students who can direct you to some of the classrooms. Um, thanks so much.